So welcome to this session. This is the low and intermediate rainfall, the inside scoop on the farm about canola production. So we're going to have some growing experiences here. Hopefully those will go well. Uh, our first uh, speaker is Denver Black. Uh, Denver came back home seven years ago from the farm with his, to farm with his dad. He's a third generation on the farm, which is uh, built upon the foundation his dad, Monty, and grandfather Howard built. They are into their second year of direct seeding and direct seeding 500 acres of canola. They're excited to see the benefits of soil rotation, soil on, from rotation, as well as the benefits from cleaning up cheat and goat grass. Establishing canola has been a challenge, but with Kim Fallow and the right drill opener, they think they may have found the ideal way to establish it in the area north of uh, north central Washington. So with that, I'll turn it over to Denver. Um, I decided to um, kind of specialize my time here on what I've had uh, more experience with with canola, and that's uh, seeding it. I've We've seeded two crops of it and only cut one. So we thought, well, we'll focus on what we've done more and we'll go from there. I'm not sure how many uh, people at this point are direct seeding um, their canola. It seemed like a natural fit to us and we'd asked around, at least in the area, you know, if it was something that was advantageous to direct seed it or if there were any negative um, effects. That's why I say I wanted to talk to you about direct seeding winter canola. Um, we think it's a really good match. In our area, um, we're typically wheat on fallow. This is our um, result this year. This is our direct seeded winter canola. Oh, I don't know. It's got to be at least two weeks afterwards, I would say, because the stuff seems to take forever to come out of the ground. But um, this is the emergence we had. Um, now go ahead and advance the slide. And that's what we had last year. So we feel like we made an improvement on the situation. Um, we found a... Um, we found a lot of challenges associated with direct seeding winter canola. Um, it, it's made us better farmers in general. Go ahead and advance the slide, Dale. Um, so what we think was wrong, I, I want to start by talking about what we think we had issues with and then take you along in our journey to making that better. One, the, one of the key issues we found early on was packing pressure. Um, everybody told me not to dig for quite a while, but I can't help it. I'm, I'm kind of meticulous that way, so I was out on my knees constantly and digging, and we, what we couldn't help um, pondering was the fact that every time we made a turn with our FlexiCoil 5000 drill, we had a perfect 100% stand there. And what we came to find was that those packers, as the gang of packers would miss a line from the openers in the turn, we had a perfect stand. So as we got to thinking about it, we realized, well, hey, maybe this has something to do with packing pressure. And um, more of the research we started to do on it seemed to indicate that. Um, so the other thing we found was that a coarse seed bed, soil texture is key. And the more I started researching this, the more I've been finding out that that's common among all crops. The smaller the seed, the more, more particular your seed bed. And so we found that our soil was too coarse. What we, one way we remedied that was through um, coulters. Uh, I think you see on the turbo tiller in there is coulters. We actually modified a toolbar, uh, an old John Deere 1600 that we had from um, our tillage uh, days and we went ahead and put on a Yetter um, coulter that just bolts onto that and what we found that allowed us to do was to um, min till that soil just enough and at the time it really doesn't look like you're doing much but it allows us to start to make that soil a little more malleable in the early stages of direct seeding when they tend to get in our chem fallow you know we're eight to ten inches of rainfall so you get later into that year and that chem fallow really sets up um, Tom Poole likens it to uh, scoring a brick and sometimes it really looks like that's all you're doing. You just see a little squiggle line where you've been. But just that scoring when you come back to seed does quite a bit. Um, another thing we learned is managing residue is key. Um, before we got into this we uh, had a really great crop and we were forced with something we weren't used to in our area which was a lot of biomass and residue. and so. We weren't yet getting into the direct seeding, and so we said, hey, let's bale it, you know. And so we had it baled. Well, in turn, you know, there's always uh, chaff rows that you don't get everything picked up on. And when we came back and uh, looked at our results, it turned out we had absolutely zero canola for every chaff row. It was just not there. Um, I'll, I'll touch on that later um, as to how we resolved that. But obviously, 
I, I thought we were thinking it was wheat straw allopathy. Now, after the guy spoke this morning, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it was more of a mechanical issue of straw actually covering that and that plant having a hard time setting its growth point. Um, I believe a chopper and a, or a good spreader is key on the combine. And then um, you need a, if you don't have row cleaners on, say, a, a disc, you need a, a disc drill. You need a, some kind of opener that will open that furrow up more. The opener we were using was a real... Um, shallow uh, entry angle on the opener and that soil tends to just kind of lift and go right back where it came from and it left that straw on top. The opener we've gone to actually moves the, the, the debris outward from the row and kind of having a row cleaning effect and it's, it's had a really positive result on it. Go ahead, Dan. So more troubles. Uh, it, it goes on and on. It was quite the experience. Seed placement. So setting the seed on moisture. Um, that's what we were told by a lot of people, set it on moisture. Um, well, you know, we didn't have good results with setting it on moisture. We found we needed it in the moisture. This last year we went the opposite direction. We said we didn't get a good result that way. Let's put it in the moisture. We went in one inch and thought we'd accommodate for some dry down. We didn't see dry down. In fact, we saw corking um, from putting it in at just one inch. So we found that if you get it in a quarter inch of moisture <laughs> and you can keep it there, that it seems to be ideal. Um, Let's see, although all, um, the fertilizer type and placement is key. You know, we use uh, UN32, which everyone says, oh, geez, you know, put that stuff in row. It's as safe as you can get. Well, you know, we have coarse, sandy soils, and it's hot and dry. And uh, a neighbor who's using a conserva pack who has vertical and horizontal separation happened to try Agritain and found, uh, he picked up, what did he say, over 10 bushel per acre yield on that. And... All he can figure is it must be that 50% that component of ammonia uh, or urea as it converts through ammonia is volatilizing and having some seed burn. Um, so we went ahead and started using Agritain to slow that conversion down. As I say there, you know, it's hot, dry sand, so volatilization is happening. This is a picture, one of our better fields in 2012. You know, it wasn't a total loss, and, and Dale actually was very helpful, WSU Extension, in coming out and telling us, you know, don't get too discouraged. This plant is amazing. It will do things. And, you know, we're wheat farmers, so we, we said, thanks, Dale. We'll, 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 you know, we'll believe you when we see it. And, uh, and we did see quite an improvement. Um, go ahead. So this is, this is the difference. This is late October this year. Um, it's quite a difference in stand. We went from um, our, an average of a plant per meter last year um, to now, uh, I think our count was somewhere in eight to 10 plants per linear foot in row. Um, so we had phenomenal results. We seeded earlier as well. And as they're saying, well, I guess we didn't seed early compared to what some of these people are saying. We seeded uh, on August 6th. Now the yield, I should mention from the previous crop um, was surprising. That one plant per meter, even in our dry area, actually yielded 1,100 pounds on average. And so we were, we were very happy with that, considering it looked like a total failure to us. And we went ahead and seeded, I should mention, some spring canola into the patchier spots, um, what, cropland 930, I think, and earlier maturing, and it actually yielded 900 pounds. So we were really impressed with that. Go ahead, Dale. So the changes for the better. I kind of wanted to give you the bad, now I'd like to give you the better, what we have learned. And so hopefully maybe you guys, as you proceed, won't make the mistakes we have at least. Um, what we did is we made a change up for the packing pressure. We went to a five inch semi-pneumatic packer wheel on the drill we updated to. The way we had decided we either needed to go to a paired row design and put that seat on either side of a packer wheel or we needed to distribute that weight better. So we went ahead, because of the opener we chose, um, there's a little picture of it down here in the bottom of the screen. The opener we chose um, has a flexible boot on it because we have a lot of rocks and we were finding having issues with a, a more elaborate opener, an opener in our rocks. And so this one didn't offer paragrowth. So since we didn't have that option, we decided to go with a five and a half inch semi-pneumatic packer wheel and lower our pounds per square inch to go ahead and try and eliminate that corking issue we were seeing with the canola. And we think we have. It, it came up really well, and it did get a good seal. We were a little worried with a narrow opener and such a wide packer that perhaps there'd be a void there, but we didn't find that. And that wider packer wheel also did a better job breaking some of those clods you end up with. Um, you need a finer seed bed. Um, again, this opener, uh, it was phenomenal. We learned a lot of things. I found a publication um, out of Australia, 30-page publication on opener theory, and you know it really helped clear up some of the, some of the um, questions we had. But one that was key was 
the entry angle that you need a, a knife in my opinion at least in our soils that's really steep um, when you get a shallow entry angle you get a lot of clotting the soil fractures on the horizontal um, separations instead of the vertical and you end up with a lifting of clods and setting it down and you know you put a canola seed on something flat and you put a couple clods propped on it you know you're not going to have much luck and so the finer that seed bed we found the better and that combination of a steeper fertilizer knife to pulverize that soil and create you know, we all have what really feels like a three inch or two and a half inch wide band of summer fallow is what it feels like. And that's good for, good for us because we're used to summer fallow. This snow till is new to us. Um, and we also cultured ahead of the drill. That, as I mentioned before, that helped quite a bit. So the things we're looking at trying next year, um, we, we went ahead and cut higher um, in our previous wheat stubble. Um, we want to see the effects of shading, although they may not be good after the speaker we listened to earlier. Um, but we're interested in it. Like a year like this year, we have a lot of fog in our area, and we've heard about advantages to harvesting fog, um, you know, frost and things like that. And so we want to see how it does. But I really think that the next one, um, trying to get a true inner row seeding, um, is something we really want to look at because then you don't have to deal with that wheat straw, any troubles in the straw. Um, you're seeding into that zone, which is more dirt than anything. Um, the, um, the other thing we're interested in is row spacing. I know a lot of people are talking about wider row spacing and the benefits to it. Um, from some of the local people I've talked to, we actually have seen higher yields and, uh, from where we've double, double sowed, and so we've got double the seed pound and double the spacing. So I'm not sure. I think what we are thinking, the reason we're leaning towards keeping narrower too, is that we saw with our thinner stand, we got great big plants and it really did accommodate for those voids but one of the problems we ran into was that uh, we had the top third of the plant shattered out when it ripened and then the bottom third was green and we were throwing it up the back of the combine so we're thinking by a higher plant density um, and perhaps smaller plants maybe we'll have a more even ripening and that's that's one of our hopes go ahead this is just a picture of our our seating setup uh, we're using a flexible 5000 with those openers and liquid fertilizer. Um, this is the field finish we achieved. We tried in a row seeding. Uh, the previous year was on 14 inch spacing, so and this new drill is 12, so you can only do so good. But um, it, we, we found we still had good results from it and a great field finish with some standing stubble left. Here's some pictures of uh, the canola as it emerged through as I'm ashamed to say, but that's the, one of the main reasons we're growing cheatgrass. You can see the good, we have great cheatgrass residue in places to seed into. <laughs> but it'll come up through it. it, it did a great job. That. And then there on my coat there, um, that's a picture of some of those plants. Uh, the one on the right is what I would say is most of the plants look like root size, and maybe you can't see very well. The one on the left actually had what I would consider a true tap root that went down, geez, six, eight inches down. Um, seems like seven out of ten plants are kind of going sideways, but maybe three out of 10 are getting down down deeper and into the plow pan and hopefully breaking up some of that compaction that we most certainly have. That's my beautiful family out in it, in the canola. This is some of the, um, well, winter canola in the top picture, spring canola in the bottom picture. Um, you know, all in all, we had, uh, I think, great results with the canola, especially considering we had a hard time getting it established. Um, really a very plastic plant and, uh, and able to overcome a lot. The spring canola we were really impressed with. Spring anything doesn't seem to do well in our dry and hot uh, maize that we have. But as I said before, you know, we had 900 pound. Um, it did a great job and you know one of the best things, this is Roundup Ready, one of the main reasons we, we started this is to get rid of jointed grow grass and downy brome. And, and I was talking with my dad, and I said, you know, one of the best things was right towards the end. We were just, I think it was my last pass in the last field. I saw one goat grass plant as I was harvesting out of 500 acres. And, I mean, you know, it's an incredible relief to see that. So we really can't say um, how great this tool has been. So um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap that up and leave the, leave the rest of these guys. I think I've used my time, and if you have any questions, we'll be here to answer them soon. Uh, if you'd like, sure. I've got time. Take Any questions? Uh, you see it in August. Did it rain for that, or did you, the moisture was there? The moisture was great. We uh, Our last rain must have been about the early part of July. I'm not sure I have it calendared, but um, the moisture was excellent. We actually did a trial where we seeded a little uh, July 25th, and I thought I came back to seed on August 
it would have been almost August 10th when I seeded next to it, and it was huge, you know, from July 25th. I thought, this is going to be a nightmare. We didn't fertilize with it. And we came back in November, and uh, it was it was ridiculous. What we found was that in November, the stuff we'd seeded in July with no fertilizer was half the size of the stuff we'd seeded three weeks later with only 30 pounds of uh, nitrogen with it. So we're thinking maybe these guys, you know, maybe it will work in our area. Maybe we can seed earlier and earlier if we manage it right. Go ahead. Did you straight cut it? Yes, we did straight cut it. Yeah, we don't have a swather, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're losing some to shatter just from the corner of the header. Um, yeah, it definitely shatters out. I thought it wind was a bigger issue, but uh, my brother-in-law and I, we were out in the field. We saw a hailstorm coming, and we said, well, if, it's gonna, if we're going to lose it, I want to see it happen. <laughs> and we went out in the field, and we're getting ready. Here comes the hail, and it lasted about, oh, man, 30 seconds, a minute, and turned into rain, and we thought, we're in the clear. And then we were just sitting there for a while. It was, you know, it was pretty. The storm had passed. We were on our phones or whatever, and we had the windows down. And he looks at me and says, what, do you, what is that? Do you hear that? What's that sound? And those stinking pods were popping like popcorn. I mean, we were losing canola like mad because the sun came out afterwards. So, you know, uh, it's just one more thing that's interesting about it. Am I disheartened by it? Yeah, but, you know, we'll figure it out, I guess. So, any one other? More. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, what was your timing on using your culture? Uh, the timing, oh, that's a good question. Uh, we actually did it this year directly ahead of the drill, I'd say a week prior. Um, we did have a strip we tried where we cultured, I think it's like Memorial Day right around then. Um, I think the conclusion is that the, the timing really didn't seem to matter. The soil stays mellow. Um, even if you do it in Memorial, it doesn't, it doesn't, in May like that, it doesn't harden like tillage normally would, you know, if you inverted that soil. So um, that's a pro. But we, one of the reasons we lean towards um, delaying it this year is we just thought, you know, even putting that little bit of a mulch may um, inhibit those little bitty showers, those tenth of rain or quarter inch here or there from getting down in. And then also um, you do see a little more dust when you spray your chem fallow. Um, from that little bit of mulch, and so we went ahead and opted for putting it off. So, do you do, do one pass or do you do that? Yeah, just one pass seemed to be more than enough. Um, at least in at least in this year, you know, and every year is going to be different in every soil. I think in the future we um, there's going to be definite areas where I don't think we'll we'll have a need for it after the first year for, or maybe first couple of years. But some soil that's more hard or clay or whatever just may always need to be teased. I don't know. Good for now. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Denver. Our next speaker is Mark Green. Mark farms in Cloverland, where low rainfall and marginal soils make farming a challenge each year. I think we could all say that. <laughs> um, Mark has been growing rapeseed canola for the past six years with some failures, but mostly successes. He's excited about seeing the improvement in the soils, crops, using oil seeds in their rotations. Welcome, Mark. All right. Um, first of all, I'll just say a little bit about myself. I basically grew up in central Washington and Ellensburg, and I grew Timothy Hay most of my life until 06. And I bought this uh, farm from my uncle, who had been a direct seeder, Gerald Hodson. Some of you may know him. And... Uh, yeah, so we moved over here, and the uh, first thing I asked some of my neighbors is that, why do you guys grow wheat all the time and not nothing else? There was no, it was winter wheat, chem fallow winter wheat. Some people were trying, uh, actually the first couple of years that no one was trying barley. And uh, when I was a kid, um, they grew barley. They grew a lot. They grew other crops, oats and stuff. But um, anyway, so economic-wise, that's why they were growing wheat. So, um, yeah, we farm up there in Cloverland, and we were in a 12-inch rainfall area. Um, the last few years, we've been blessed with, like, 16 inches, and we've had amazing crops, and uh, we've been blessed that way. Um, my son is, uh, works with me, and my wife helps us during harvest. She drives a bank-out wagon, and we're finding that's one of the more critical jobs on the farm because she can check out the combine and see if there's smoke coming out of it or... <laughs> stop us when something's going bad and uh, yeah so if we start on these pictures I could go to the next that that was a that was an 11 crop uh, which uh, was one of our better crops and uh, it you know, we we've been I've been kind of stuck on that ton 
2,000 pound yield the last couple years. And that's, uh, I know I can grow more pounds than that. I just, uh, I think it's always been some event has kind of slowed us up. But this is our system. I got a Horsch Anderson uh, drill. And uh, we, I could haul uh, 1,700 gallons of liquid deep band, which is normally a Matheo and uh, Solution 32 or Uran. And in the grain cart, um, I have like, well, with canola or rapeseed, you don't, but the capacity is it could have like four ton of seed and four ton of dry fertilizer, which I use as my starter. We'll go to the next slide. Go ahead, go to the next one. This is uh, the opener. Now, one thing I did since we bought this drill, if you look at Chuck's uh, display out there, I've added the leading uh, disc cutler in the front, so it's very similar to an Ag Pro drill. And uh, that has made a huge difference in uh, the disturbance, and so that um, we're not throwing as much dirt out. It was interesting, Denver said that he was concerned about moving the dirt. I, I've never, uh, so far, um, we haven't had that issue of not having good soil to seed contact. Um, I'm able, the thing I love about this drill is I can set it at two inches, four inches, or whatever, and it doesn't rise out of the ground, even like in 06 and 07 in them dry years. Um, typically, um, my fertilizer system is I, uh, at planting, I put on 80 pounds of N, um, 20, 20 to 25 pounds of FOSS, um, 25 uh, pounds of sulfur, and one and a half pounds of zinc. And I have not, you know, we've talked to a lot of these uh, oil seed meetings about not fertilizing at seeding. Um, I've never felt like I've run into an issue of putting that fertilizer down at seeding time. And uh, you can go to the next slide. This is just what, this is uh, a typical, this is actually this year's canola that I planted. Um, we had great moisture this year. As a matter of fact, the last two years, I, I've been amazed, and, and part of that is just because of the, the residue. We do use our Schulte mower, and my son and I, a couple years ago, we were doing tests of not mowing. We was mowing part of a field, and then we was leaving strips, so you'd, you know, the big thing, at first I wanted to make sure we caught all the snow that would blow by. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think that has that big of an impact anymore, but since we started mowing, um, the moisture is right on top of the ground and I just that has made a huge impression so we're kind of like right now we're committed to like mowing hundred percent of our acres this these next couple slides um, I took out some CRP or I'm in the process of taking out CRP and um, that tall crested wheatgrass and sheep fescue that's in that stand has been kind of a thorn in my side and <clears throat> roundup isn't really helping, but what I did is I rented a Turbo Max, and I turned it, we went the maximum amount, six degrees is what the blades will allow you to go, and we were kind of, we were dragging some of them plants out as, as we were going down, and then as that plant started regrowing, we hit it again with Roundup, and so I thought, man, we're, we're making progress on that, and this was last spring um, that we did the Turbo Max, so in July, um, maybe I should talk a little bit about my seed timing. When, the first time I planted it, I planted uh, August 31st, and we had an okay stand. Then the next year I planted like August 10th, and we had a little bit better stand. And so as I've been moving this planting date up every year. Matter of fact, this year um, I was going to be planting on July 10th, and we were talking, some of us this morning, that July 10th in our area we had we had some rain issues, so I didn't plant this crop until uh, July 15th. But what I did here is when I ran that turbo till, um, I planted this as three inches deep. I would made the decision that, you know, we're kind of told always to plant shallow, but I wanted that seed in the moisture. And that seed was in the moisture, but it, um, I, it is a terrible stand. You can go to the next picture. Um, this is a stand that, uh, this was rapeseed uh, in, in 10. Um, that field did like, it was right at a ton, maybe just a hair over. Go to the next slide. That's, a, that's actually the same field, just a different angle. Um, you know, 
A lot of times you'll see pictures where, where it's light. And when you're combining, you'll get into them light spots and uh, you'll think, man, this is really hurting my yield. But I, I mean, I, I've, I felt like it hasn't been as bad as it looks because you still get some plants in there. And that is where you'll get your, uh, you'll get some uh, Jim Hill mustard coming up in them spots. So that is a challenge. I think an even stand. Um, one thing about that drill, it's 40 foot on 15 inch paired rows. And I've talked to Mike Stubbs quite a bit lengthy a few years ago because he's going so wide um, of row spacing. And, and I, uh, I've kind of felt like Denver said, you know, having that seed spread out and we're planting, well, Mike's down to around two pounds. And, and uh, I've been shooting between three and four. I've, I've planted up as high as five and a half pounds, but um, you know, the stand establishment is what, what makes, uh, makes your weed problem either terrible or just tolerable. <laughs> um, this is this year's crop. I had, uh, like I said, the last couple of years we've planted into great moisture. I had a good stand, but um, this morning when we were in, uh, in here, you can see some of those uh, plants look like they're dead. All that, the, the whole area of that field looked like it was dead. Matter of fact, I thought it had, I thought we had more issues than just winter kill, but um, those plants all started shooting out. A, a, you know, when we were talking about look, taking your pocket knife and cutting that root to see if it's brown or if it's white, if there's some brown in there, you'll still, you could still get a sprout. Now, some, obviously, some of them went ahead and died, but uh, you don't lose hope just because it looks like it's dead. <laughs> that this is kind of a lousy picture, but it's the only one I had of the tap root. Um, that's a shovel handle that uh, in the rape that uh, and it, it's amazing. When we were planting weed in a different field this fall, um, I was out with a field man, and we was in my uh, side by side, and I slammed the brakes on, and in front of us there was a tap root that was almost three inches across. And it was just you know over the drill, it brought it up out of the ground. And it's amazing what that is doing to our soils. I, I felt like, uh, well, this uh, fall when I took my soil samples, just taking the probe, and I, a blind man could have told the difference, but you wouldn't have. I mean, if you're blind, you wouldn't have known where you were. But where I'd planted, <laughs> where I'd planted the, the rape of the canola, the, the probe went right down the ground. I didn't have to, like, twist and turn and push on it. I could just push it that three feet, and it was just amazing. So. Uh, and uh, last year at the Direct Seed Conference, if uh, you'll remember, Ray was talking about uh, if you take your spade in the ground and you, and you bring out a shovel full of dirt, and if you find three earthworms, he considered that healthy soil. Um, I can say in these fields, when I'm doing that, I've, I can't remember not finding at least one earthworm. And in 2006, the only place you found an earthworm was underneath a rock. So um, we're making, we're making uh, progress in our soil health. This is this year's stand. Um, you can see a couple holes in there, but uh, we c I felt like we were really hurting in September. You know, we had that, uh, we had great moisture when we planted, then, then it was, we didn't get anything. And then the middle of September, it, let, it looked like it was pretty much out of, it was, it was turning that purple color and getting the veins in the leaves, but uh, I think it's gonna be all right. I, I, I'm not too worried about it. That's just another picture. This is a little bit younger in the stand. This is probably uh, in between these other pictures that have been going on. Well, one thing I, that uh, I kind of learned early on is uh, when, when we're harvesting, since there's only three of us, um, I don't like to go down wait in line down at Columbia Grain. And so uh, we, we, have our, we can store most of our product that we grow. And what we did here is I had uh, a floor in there. I got these bins from my brother-in-law who farms in Quincy. And uh, he had co fo uh, floors in them for corn. So I took them out and I put canola floors in. And I originally, when I put the other floors in, I didn't think that, uh, that the canola would go through it. But the holes are just big enough that, uh, yeah, when you turn the aerator on and that uh, stuff's vibrating, you're going you're gonna to put seed underneath the floor. I also got a temperature sensor there. You can go to the next one. Um, just so I know what's going on in there. Um, you don't want, uh, if you're going to store it, you got to, 
you don't want it to start smoking. This was an issue we had last year. We had over 400 elk in there from Thanksgiving until April 10th. And they, that field, when that snow was off, it looked like you took a rototiller out of, on it. And um, got some pretty nice sheds out of that thing, too. But um, <laughs> I, I didn't know what to expect. I, I, um, Dick Whitman had told me not to worry about it. But uh, anyways, Come to, what it, that really helped us because when that turned hot in May, when everything was blooming in May except for this field, and it was just a little bit further behind enough, and uh, it yielded twice as good as the other field. And we ran and that. Normally, the rape will uh, will bloom for four to five weeks. This year, it was like ten days, and uh, so that that cut our yield in half. I mean, our our yields this year were terrible. It was uh, one field went 700 and this field here was just under 1,500 pounds. And, you know, that's not, I'm not satisfied that. This is the last slide, but this, those are sheep there that uh, they also like to come and, and eat the crop. But my point here on this slide is a couple years ago I planted this field, and that is in September. And I, the, I had a terrible stand. And I, I made up my mind that I was going to wait till like the, the 20th of October and then I was going to make a decision on that day. And the stand hadn't changed any, so I took Roundup out there and I uh, sprayed it and I planted winter wheat in it. And so I think as you're growing oil seeds, you can't be afraid to start over. Um, that was, uh, I mean, that's just something I do every year. You know, you talk about plants per square foot or how many ever in a lean yield foot. But um, profitability-wise, I think there's times when it's just better to put wheat in, and I'm not afraid of that. I think that's it. So, you got any questions? Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, you said you uh, mow your stubble down every year. What is the best time you've found to do that? Well, <clears throat> we like to wait until we ain't going to start a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, we were talking about that this year because we didn't get done. And so now we're going to be doing it in the springtime, and we have not liked doing it in the springtime. So this year we're going to get set up to be able to put out a fire if we get it, and we're going to be doing it in August. Yeah. How about pod sealing? I I have never used that. Uh, that is an option, but I haven't had a shadow problem yet either. I mean, when it's getting close to being harvested, I've been kind of concerned. Like, man, if we get a big windstorm, um, because we can get them. Uh, the other day it was 67 miles an hour here. And it's like. But yeah, I have never used the pod sealant. I know some guys do, the outside of the field. Um, so far, so good. All right. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Juris. Andy was born and raised on a wheat farm in Bickleton where he now uh, farms with his father, Ron Juris. After graduation from the University of North Dakota with a degree in aeronautical science, so I guess he's flying these things on now. <laughs> Andy worked as an airline pilot for, uh, for a decade. While he enjoyed his career in aviation, Andy always longed to return to the farm. So in 2008, he and his wife moved from St. Louis back to the farm. While a far cry from his days in the cockpit, farming is where Andy believes he is meant to be, and he's thankful for the opportunity. So let's welcome Andy. Howdy. Uh, when uh, Karen asked me to come talk, I was, I'm kind of pinch hitting for somebody who knows a heck of a lot more about canola than I do. So I apologize for that. And so we're going to talk about the, the canola crop that we grew and the one that's in the field right now and all that good stuff, but also just kind of an overview of our farming system while we're at it. And, uh, I, you know, so at least you can feel like I've had something to say, mostly. So uh, uh, go ahead to the next one here. All right, you kind of got most of the, uh, the stuff already, but we're on the fourth generation to come home to farm, and uh, we're around that 4,800 acres uh, farmed right now with three to five thousand acres of custom farming a year. Uh, we do custom harvesting and custom seeding and 
uh, it kind of is up and down and all that good stuff. But uh, and 100 percent direct seed since 1996. We weren't, I guess, that's a little misleading. We weren't 100 percent. We kind of got into it over a couple of years, but we are now and have been for quite a while. And we're dry land, six to 12 inch rainfall. I don't know that 12 inch rainfall thing is like marijuana is legal in Washington. I think that's what they were using when they decided it was 12 inches because <laughs> it's. It's, it's not. A lot of times it's more of the six, it's more like four, and you guys kind of know the story. And then uh, wheat, alfalfa, forage, triticale, and canola. Used to grow some barley, but it's been quite a while. And uh, go ahead to the next one there. And there we were. That's my wife and me on the coldest day we've ever taken a picture in right there. And then uh, here we are in harvest. That's my dad, Ron Juris. Probably some of you are pretty familiar with, with my dad. He's been around... Uh, uh, conservation districts and wheat growers over the years and my mom. There we are in alfalfa. You just proves you can grow alfalfa in eight inches of rain uh, or that year particular year we were closer to our 12. That's the most year water we've gotten a long time, 2011. That was about what two ton Dan? Okay yeah about two ton alfalfa uh, right there and uh, I thought I'd show you the best crop we ever got, not this year's. So uh, actually I didn't take pictures. There we are. We use a cross slot drill. Uh, we're one of those crazy people that do that. And uh, it's a 37 foot set up on 12 inch spacing and uh, with two seed boxes on there so we can either put dry fertilizer down. We also, we primarily use uh, liquid. And uh, this year's the first year we used a Shelbourne Reynolds uh, stripper header with the cross slot drill. We, we really wanted to have the ability to retain uh, uh, the benefits of that tall stubble. I know some guys like to mow and they see a lot of benefit from that. We, we no longer have the problem of getting through the residue, so we decided we were going to go more with uh, the increased shading for moisture retention. I know we've been hearing some stuff about canola and shading. Uh, I'm kind of more a little bit, I don't know if I don't have water, it doesn't really matter. So, um, uh, so we're going for water. And uh, go ahead to the next one. Uh, here's some of the snow that we got this year. We got an inch of snow and about uh, four inches of wind right on top of it. And if you're looking, that's standing in a gate. My dad took the picture and that one the, on the left with the ditch full of snow, that was a forage triticale field that was just swathed off right at the ground. And then just turning and looking the other direction, that was a wheat field with strip stubble. So you can see some of the retention right there. Go ahead to the next one. That was another field. You had our neighbors uh, right there. Uh, they have a case drill that requires them to just take it right off at the ground and run it through a chopper. They start really having some problems. And, uh, and then that's our field uh, right in the same area. The county loves it. We hope they would pay us. They don't have to <laughs> plow. So uh, anyway, so canola in 2013, uh, we had about 220 uh, acres planted, not harvested. Uh, uh, well, it's not quite that bad, but um, uh, the uh, spring canola uh, was, uh, we'll get into a little, yeah, Invigor 5440, uh, Liberty Link. We decided we'd try different chemistry for us, uh, and Curtis Hennings uh, got us uh, this stuff, and uh, we liked it, and Liberty's nice, as long as you don't have to pay for it, but uh, it works good. And then the winter variety was one of his, it was fall staff, it was what he recommended uh, and we'll get in a little bit to why you recommended that. Okay, seeding canola. I think it was May 1st. You know how this goes. You don't remember what you did. Um, four and a half pounds an acre. It was right in that May, right in the beginning of May. We were a little late getting in there. Uh, four and a half pounds an acre. Um, we had some issues with getting the drill to seed that rate. 70 pounds of nitrogen is what we were shooting for, plus what we had in the dirt. And... Uh, uh, it was a 40, 12, 10, 10. It was basically what we were using on, uh, on the wheat is what we were trying to do. So uh, it, we just kind of had the regular fertilizer program we had for wheat. We put it on. It was at the end of the season. We were a little desperate. We, we usually try to do that 4 to 1 ratio sulfur. Uh, that's kind of where we usually end up anyway. And, uh, and then problems encountered was late seeding date. We'd had kind of a rough spring. Uh, in terms of just breakdowns and some other things that were giving us some issues. So the canola and getting it in the drill and calibrated and all the good stuff, uh, it just got pushed back. And so we got in uh, later than we probably should have been. 
Uh, then uh, fertilizer mix, uh, like I said, it wasn't tailored to maybe some of the more specific needs of canola. Um, I'm not really, like I said, first year doing this, I'm not the best one to be asking. Uh, who, there's some guys later speaking at this conference that are going to be way more knowledgeable than me about this. But uh, uh, again, that could have been. And then the seeding rate. Uh, the seeding rate was actually a problem uh, for a couple of reasons. One is our drill did not adequately meter out the seeds slow enough. And so basically what you ended up doing is running it in manual and seeding at about nine miles an hour, which a cross slot will do, but I can't do that. And so I had several screw-ups, and some of those screw-ups meant it was way under and way over and all that kind of thing, led to some interesting uh, uh, results. Go ahead. So there we are coming just uh, coming up there, some of the various stages. It, the cross slot did a fantastic job of a uniform stand. Um, we went, you know, we see that the top was dry, just barely. I mean, enough to make it dust, but nice and wet underneath. But it, we've, in the mm, early, mid-90s, my dad uh, did rapeseed for about three years, and we really, really struggled. We had a Concord uh, shovel hoe-type opener, and it just really, really was a struggle. This, boy, it just laid it right in there exactly where we wanted. We did not have any issues. Go ahead to the next one there. Now you can see it starting to come up, and the whole field pretty much looked like this. And we thought, boy, that's just really really great. Well, ended up we had this huge plant population, just massive. Uh, go ahead to the, and there we are, it's uh, starting to bolt. My dad's out there, and uh, go ahead. So here we are flowering, um, and right about this time being so late is when we started getting some really, some of that really hot weather that got just about all of us with whether, whatever it was, wheat, canola, and really kind of shut down the flowering a little bit. And we had okay moisture going into it because we had some late rain that ruined our hay crop this year. But, uh, and uh, going into it, but it, boy, we used it right up. We used the water right up and, and started to really stress uh, things here. And there we are. It's uh, uh, starting to get ripe. We're getting pretty close. But when we went to harvest it, we ended up with a yield of about 800 pounds. Disappointing considering the stand that we had out there, or what it looked like. Um, I think some of that we just ran out of water and we had a really thick stand and when we were going across the field you were cutting you know five bushel three bushel and then you started hitting these spots where i'd screwed up with the uh, uh with the seeding rate and i'd had it too low and all of a sudden it looked more like a jim hill mustard all the other ones looked like a little arbovita i mean they were just these narrow little things that little pods on the top and uh, uh, when you hit those, all of a sudden you're seeing 35, 36, 40 bushel. And, you know, my screw-ups inadvertently kind of showed us some interesting uh, aspects of it. Now, of course, the areas that I accidentally let it go to zero, we didn't have that much. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, yeah, so thinner was a little bit better. So, okay, we can go to the next one. Uh, uh, the uh, seeding date was July. I had third on there, and then we got talking. It was actually the 5th of July uh, was when we seeded. Primarily, the reason we did this is because we do custom harvesting the entire month of July and August, and this was our only chance to do it. We, we've we heard about the guys that are early seeding canola. We were really interested in it. Um, in our country, we're high altitude, we're low rainfall, and we're really low on dirt. Uh, so, really low on dirt, so in places. And oftentimes we can't hold fallow moisture into August. Uh, we just can't do it. It's gone once you get to mid-July, 1st of August, it's not there. You, you, or, you know, and guys are talking about seeding canola two, three inches deep. Well, when you go from maybe six, you're really not going to make it. So, um, so we seeded. We had good moisture. Again, we had the rains in June. And... Uh, uh, 2.5 pounds an acre is what we shot for. Uh, with the fall staff, we uh, was recommended to us because he Curtis felt maybe it wouldn't uh, bolt prematurely. That was a big concern. Uh, now fertilizer, none at time of seeding. We didn't put anything on. Again, we were trying to discourage the stem elongation and all that stuff. Uh, we came back in in late October with a mix of 1929. Uh, so we trying to go with that about like a two to one ratio on the sulfur. Uh, I believe we put 
Oh, it was 40, 50 pounds on total nitrogen on with that. And then a little bit of zinc and a little bit of boron. Our soil test showed we were really low on both and uh, was talking with Karen and, and she was recommending a little bit of boron. Uh, row spacing wasn't really a problem, I guess, but guys are talking about increasing your row spacing. Uh, we've been up to look at Mike Stubbs and, and uh, stuff that uh, he was doing. Our drill now, we have the valves, we have the ability to lock out one rank of the, of the openers so we could seed on 24s if we needed to. And that might, that's probably, I mean, we have the ability to do it. We're probably going to experiment in the future with that and see how that goes. Plant population, initially I put that in there because I thought it was a problem. I thought it was way too thick. Curtis looked at it. He's thinking maybe I'm a little better off than I, I feel better now so, than I did a day ago. So go ahead to the next one. There were, uh, there were seeding it, and it was dry and hot. You know, one of the reasons, again, we went with the cross slot, we're trying not to disturb as much as we can because we open it up and we lose the moisture right off the bat. And, and so when we seeded it, it'd been, it was about 86 degrees. When I, I took a temperature reading, it was 86 degrees. And it was that warm beforehand for quite a while, and it got nothing but hotter after that. And uh, uh, and in going, starting to go up, you know, into the 90s and everything. And the day I was out here doing it, you know, it looked like you're seeding the surface of the moon. You know, it's dusty and everything. You had to actually dig uh, to see if there was moisture. Then there was. There was some pretty good moisture. We'll go to the next one. There it's starting to come up. I I was gone driving a combine then, and my mom and dad took these pictures. Uh, but they're probably early August, late July, some, some late July. Okay, and uh, you can see uh, that that's pretty much what we have. The uh, blank spot there. I'm not sure what that is. It's in the edge. Uh, we border a neighbor's field. He might have turned around out there with. Uh, sprayer and we we don't use any long-term residual su's or anything like that haven't in quite a while so we really try to stay away from that so we have the option of rotation and go to the next one you can see some of the plant mass uh, root masses that we have uh, one of the issues that we have as i mentioned we didn't put on any fertility and uh, uh, you can see the purple leaf I, I don't have a better picture i couldn't come up with one that looked good on powerpoint uh, but that purple leaf on the picture on the right, we started seeing it look like a malaria germ growing out there in our field. Weird patterns, uh, stunted plants, purple leaves, and uh, talked to several people about it, decided it was phosphorus deficiency. And then come to find out you can add some phosphorus at seeding and not have that risk of bolting nearly as much as if you put on uh, a bunch of nitrogen. So we're probably looking at putting on some 1034 uh, next time we do this. Uh, the, uh, the root mass is you have a healthy plant and then a not so healthy one there. You can see the not so healthy one, big chunk of hair like roots all up close to the top, but not a real healthy tap root going down. You can see on the healthier plant we have that. So, in the long run, we'll find out. Uh, the mix we put on had a little bit of phosphorus in it that we stream, use stream bars and a sprayer to put on. I don't know, it's soil surface applied. Phosphorus doesn't move that much. We'll see if it does anything or not. So, Oh, my wife put that in as a joke. Uh, I didn't know she did. She, she put this together for me. I, I'm standing on my knees. It looks better than it is. I did that for neighbors. So, yeah, sorry about that. So, but that's uh, all I have. If anybody's got any questions. Okay, so I guess we're at our panel time now. So um, this is uh, stumped to somebody. Um, so if you got some questions, yeah, go ahead. How did you harvest it? Who are you talking to? Uh, we, we direct cut it with a combine and draper head. We didn't have the top cross hog or anything, and it wasn't real tall, so it, it went in okay. But we did spray pod seal on ours. We had about a 40 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour down draft thunderstorm come in. Thanks. Uh, about a day or two before we cut it and we did see a little shatter but it wasn't all in on the ground so I don't recommend you walk through it though it'll make you cry <laughs> yeah we were the same we direct cut with a draper header we did use the cross auger and uh, I don't know I think it helped around the auger that we had to cut off all the time so I'm not sure whether it was good or bad we spent a lot of off, so but that's what we did. 
You know, we direct cut too. I will say uh, we've had a auger header up until last year, and then we got a draper header, and um, I think we like the draper header a lot better. Other questions? This is your your chance to talk to these three in a panel session. So, yes, sir. Does anybody know if you want to plant in early June or late May? Do you have to go with the bolt resistant varieties, or can you cut fertilizer and go with the Roundup Ready variety? Has anybody had any experience? Yeah, I think it'd be fine. You might just have to mow it or put some uh, um, growth inhibitor on it. Yeah, that's. I was. We tried uh, Roundup Ready variety at the end of July. I think I may have mentioned that. And um, without the fertility, like Andy said, I, we definitely didn't see any stem elongation. We did try some hybrid, uh, but it was seeded later, um, the first of August. So we didn't didn't try that. But at July, I mean, we saw such a difference in size. It was so much smaller with no fertility than with only 30 pounds that I. From that experience, I can't imagine how you'd run into bolting problems if you didn't, or we had just no fertility in that field, one or the other. <laughs> we, we went with, uh, we didn't go with any GMO for the winter stuff, mainly just because we we'd heard that Monsanto, in order to get the Roundup resistant genetics, had crossed it with a spring uh, variety to get it, and so that does make it a little bit more without any kind of mowing or, or growth inhibitor, it's a little bit more premature, or it tend, it's a lot more prone to bolt early. Uh, or if it, you get a real warm spell in January, February, it might decide to try to do something. So in our country, we're, we're high altitude relatively. I mean, some people are higher, but we're at that 3,000 foot level, but we can still sometimes get a really abnormally warm stretch, and we're worried about that. I don't know if it's legitimate or not, but. Do you have an auger on your grape Yes, yeah, the top auger. Do you know about it? I, I think you probably could. You might, what you might happen is might some of it might go over the top. One thing I did, I did mention when I was, uh, I do top dress mine. Um, in the springtime, typically I'll come on with a, a cord of uh, boron and 30 pounds of N. Well, I, I am going to streamer nozzles this year, but I have been just doing with an XR. So it's been a pretty fine miss. And for herbicides, um, a sure two, 10 to 12 ounces, and uh, equal amount of crop oil. And that smokes the goat grass, and it's a good program. You know, that, that is a big issue up in our country is just the, the grasses that are coming in. Um, and I'm not a, we sold the plow, so I'm, I'm, I'm not looking back to that. I just, we got to deal with it. <laughs> Other questions? All right, any comments you uh, fellows would like to share before we close this off we've got a couple of minutes yeah I'll add uh, that as well as Mark said we used uh, we top dressed with stream nozzles we didn't buy the bars we just bought the t-jet ones and we came through uh, really early spring I mean the plants were just coming out um, probably of their winter slump and we went ahead and put on UN32 and uh, some sulfur and then some boron as well. We'd heard the importance of boron, so we went ahead and streamed on some boron as well. And it seemed to work out pretty well. I got one more. Okay. How much are you guys fertilizing it relative to your winter wheat crops? Uh, our spring stuff, we fertilize like we would a DNS crop. So we, we do 3.4 pounds of N per bushel is what we we're, we're shooting for in DNS. So we did, went ahead with the same program there. And the winter, I don't know, you flip a coin. I, I, we're, we're, you know, we put on a, a, what we thought was a fairly good shot this fall. We'll, we'll see what kind of rain we get, whether or not we come back in with maybe a little bit more, maybe just more nitrogen or something this spring, we'll see. 
what do you do as far as the garage and the control? Because you just mentioned the sure too, but that was progressing recently, right? Yeah. So we get the raw new problems or you just skip the roundup <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we used Roundup Ready, and it smoked the broad leaves all week. Yeah, well, in the, in the non-GMO, yeah, there's not much options. And Stinger, well, a weed that we have a problem with is uh, uh, bed straw, and Stinger will damage that. But, uh, yeah, there's not. that's why it's so important to have a good stand, is because those holes will just fill up with weeds. Yeah, Steve? You guys, um, do you contract? Your your crop. Um, does, I got kind of a two uh, two fold question here. Does thirteen dollar canola change your plan? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not too happy with the price right now. <laughs> That's why I'm storing it. Um, I mean, I'm probably willing to wait it out. If if uh, if the outfits really want the canola, they're going to have to pay so we can. Um, continue to grow it. I will say uh, with growing the rapeseed, um, I've never sold it less than 25 cents. And so it's a little more stable market. But then I imagine if everybody in here grew 100 or 1,000 acres of rapeseed, that that price would go away too. So. Uh, yeah, I would, I'm with him. I don't like the prices right now. But uh, I know, um, I think Karen asked me to address that and I forgot to do that. I, uh, our opinion is uh, there's so much to gain from having a rotational crop that we have never experienced before. And, you know, I ran the math the other day and at the current price, we're still even pa on par with we winter wheat anyways. So I think with the benefits we can see on the winter wheat on the backside anyways, at this point, um, I still think it's, it's very favorable. But I just think for us, there's just so many unknowns and so many possible benefits to reap from having a rotational crop, not only being able to hit the weeds we have such a hard time with, with an option like the Roundup Ready canola, but just the soil health and the water infiltration and the compaction. Um, I just think, at least in my, in, in our view, our farm view, we're looking, trying to look big picture. And sometimes when you look big picture, you take it, you know, a hit today, so you have something better in the future. So that's kind of our outlook. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, with, with Denver. I, I think, you know, and the same thing with us with alfalfa and the forage crops, uh, you know, it's something where you adjust your rotation, yeah, at times with prices and stuff a little bit, but, but you got, can't have, for us, we can't have all our eggs in one basket. Uh, we can't, you know, what if wheat's 450, you know? I mean, I don't know where it's going. Hopefully not that, but, but uh, you know, as we, as we look to the future, I try not to chase today's dollars, but you know if you do, you're going to end up chasing your tail all day long. So pretty much what everything what they said, and we're trying to establish canola as a rotation along with some other things. And once we do, we're you know short of something really bad happening like back in the '90s when it was six cents a pound to Lethbridge, Alberta. Then we'll probably try to stick with it. What's the best straw done for your grape? Money. The rape, yeah. yeah, they don't want it. <laughs> you think you press it, and that that is an option we haven't even talked about here. I I bought a oil seed press here a few years ago, and I just dropped the motor off at the electrician on the way up here. Um, my plan is to produce at least 50 percent of the fuel for the farm, and uh, I've been making biodiesel since '06. And I have I've never had a problem with it yet. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, let's thank our jury panel.